Those are Costco socks. Yep. They're great. Yep. But I will say that darn tough wool yeah. socks are worth the difference. I just went to Costco this week, actually. Spent $400 because of the Red Sea crisis. I wanted to stock up. <laughs> you think that there's going to be... Yeah. I mean, not you. Th- well, I no, trust, prices I trust are reads. going to go up. Like six out of 10 of the shippers who usually go through that channel, yeah, the, the biggest They keep a good hope. Mm-hmm. They're going around the Cape of Good Hope. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. going to make prices go up. Mm-hmm. For mm-hmm. sure. Isn't it something like it's it's absurdly cheap to ship stuff via sea that like it doesn't... But I guess it does. Yeah, because they use like the shittiest yeah. oil imaginable. Like no, I think thing. if you ship like a pair of shoes from like one end of the Atlantic to the other, it costs like six cents. Yep. Yeah. Wild that we've achieved. I that. think it's yeah, it's <laughs> less expensive for China to the U.S. than the other way around. Mm. For some reason, I forget. Yeah. Subsidized by some government or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, but yeah, I'll do the intro. Okay. Hi everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Silent Generation. We have a brand new mic set up because we're testing having out a guest. We have a guest that we are friends with in real life. His name is Rafa. Hey guys, how's it going? Yeah, and so I thought Rafa would be a good guest for this week's episode because he is from San Jose and we're gonna be talking about Silicon Valley aesthetics. Yeah, also from Palo Alto. That's usually more impressive than what I lead with in real life. So what are you actually from them? Like I what? mean, I lived in both. I did oh, high school okay. in Palo Alto, but yeah. 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 Mm. I remember I met you about like a year ago in a bar mm-hmm. and you said you were from Palo Alto <laughs> <laughs> and the impression it made was so bizarre. It felt like something like you're not supposed fiction. to be. <laughs> oh, okay. I've never met anyone from really that part of the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. It's all boring office parks. And I mean, they build there. They build like we used to build in Chicago there. Except yeah. it's, you know, B2B SaaS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we'll learn more about, though, like your experience um, moving from Silicon Valley to Chicago and your like experience growing up there. But we'll start out by talking about Silicon Valley companies, namely the Fang companies, before we move into learning more about Rafa and talking about sort of the urban landscape of San Jose and the larger Silicon Valley region. So Fang, as a group, is a concept that was developed by Jim Cramer in 2013. It's a group of companies that stand for Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. And Jim Cramer has notoriously been very bad at investing, but (laughs) um, these five companies since 2013 have really outperformed the market. Mm -hmm. They were not a bad investment to make back then, and they've only grown in power and influence since. Mm -hmm. I had heard Microsoft in there. Am I wrong? Um, I mean, Wasn't yeah. Was it Famga at some point with the M being for Microsoft? Am I trying um, to... Yeah, definitely. Um, it's mm-hmm. varied through time, especially with all the different name changes. Yeah. I think yeah. I've heard like oh, Manga yeah. or something or Mang. Because now Facebook is Meta and Google is Alphabet. Right, so. right. Yeah. yeah. No, Microsoft, it's okay that we're excluding it <laughs> because it's the least visually interesting of any of these companies. Not that I did that intentionally. Uh-huh. I actually forgot about Microsoft. Yeah, no, I was actually thinking like, oh man, I actually have some stuff to say about their take on design. Maybe when we get into like the kind of flat aesthetics thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Microsoft is so often maligned as like of all these new rich companies, Microsoft is like the oldest of the new crowd. Or you could see them as the youngest of like the IBM generation, which they were like saw themselves in opposition to. So they're like the weird like I don't know. The, um, yeah, no keystone one, between the two. No one gets excited about Microsoft. They don't think it has that much room to grow. No, it's, um, it's Microsoft Word. It's just like it's the most like banal, like everyday parts of our like the kind of just yeah. there. Um, I think they the did acquire OpenAI though. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they have their foot in that game. There's mm-hmm. room for them to like dominate in that way. Yeah, I, I disagree completely. I don't. Know. <laughs> I, I, I I work as an Azure developer, so yeah. this is like you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, sure. What's but, Azure used for? Huh? It's just, you know, how people use AWS. Like oh. Amazon makes no money. All of their yeah. money is made in AWS because, mm-hmm. I mean, they purposely run the shipping at a loss, right? Mm-hmm. But no, Microsoft has just been the cornerstone of business now for a while. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm actually invested in them. I uh, invested for the first time during the coronavirus pandemic when everything started to crash. 
And yep. um, I didn't even know what ETFs were at the time. But one of the companies I invested in during that week when so many companies were in free fall was Microsoft. And that's been a, a good bet for me. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Blue chip. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I've always been a big ETFs guy. I don't really pick individual stocks. I think that's more of a reflection of like not my actual economic knowledge, but rather like my personality where I, I often do defer to experts and things. And so I don't know the odds that I could pick a sp- Doc better than someone whose job it is. Like I just kind of like I'll defer to the, yeah, uh, ETFs on that one. Yeah, I remember actually he, watching a clip with Jim Cramer in it, or I forget what he was talking about, but he said something along the lines of like we as everyday investors need to think like the people on Wall Street. Mm-hmm. Which the older I've gotten and the more I've learned the past few years, I can see how true that is because I am not advocating for these companies to swallow up smaller companies and to mm-hmm. grow through mergers and acquisitions. Like the way that these companies are largely growing, I'm not like morally okay with. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not gonna be on like shareholder calls or like mm-hmm. voting in shareholder votes for the things that would actually make them more profitable. Mm-hmm. So yeah, ETFs are like, you can just invest in them and then sleep more peacefully at night. Yeah, um, It's a bit easier. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we got Microsoft out of the way, but <laughs> we can move on to Facebook. So Facebook, it's closely associated with the corporate Memphis aesthetic, which mm-hmm. was described through Arena. Are any of you familiar with Arena? No. The It's like a website where the way you type it in is like A-R-E dot N-A. Oh. And it's used by like people who are interested in aesthetics and people in fine arts. That's like a good place that we could post some of our ideas. Yeah. I've thought about doing that. But some of the people that were involved with like the Y2K Aesthetic Institute on Facebook, they migrated over to Arena. Interesting. And then um, they started to compile a bunch of different aesthetics together, like Global Internet Cafe. Mm. Am I saying that right? I know there's like yep. Global mm-hmm. Internet Cafe. I always, I always second guess that in I my head. I think it's Global Coffee House. I Global think. Coffee House. Right. So, yeah, see, I always get it slightly mixed up. But they came up with that, um, I think, through Arena. But another one they came up with is Corporate Memphis. And so... That particular aesthetic, it will come to mind if you think about like distorted representations of people in squiggles. Mm-hmm. Um, like you'll see it in like a Kraft mac and cheese commercial. Mm-hmm. You'll see it on like Instagram mm-hmm. in different ways. Flat, oversized bodies, pastel tones, and then they'll make human skin tones like wildly different, like purple, blue, stuff like that to make everything very ambiguous and applicable. Yeah. You know? It's a way to make you think about diversity without actually depicting diversity, Mm -hmm. because I think they were still interested in the principles of diversity. But even by 2017, when Facebook started to push out content with this aesthetic, it was already like people were like a bit tired of like woke identity stuff, maybe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I still see it even today in 2023. Yeah, you see it in like bus stops, like anything for a company like no matter what you're selling like there's a yeah, default to this like I think it's it's like a lack of borders in it is one thing like there are like color tone differentials um, but yeah everything is just very like yeah flat and this was like out of reaction to way too much skeuomorphism in like graphic design and that's where you actually try and like represent something it's like how the old notes app on your phone used to be like a leather bound book and have yeah. stitching on it and so all that stuff was deemed passe and then pushed out like the old Instagram app icon where it was like an old instant camera, like a Polaroid esque sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, that was I don't know. I, I've really celebrated the downfall of that. I was a weird like graphic design light obsessive. I used to be into like I used to load custom software on my Android phone so I could make it more aesthetic. This is a lost period of my life. But um, I just really hated anything like skeuomorphic and I was cheering on as like. Android flattened itself. And then Microsoft, back when Windows Phone was a thing, I never got a Windows Phone, but I really respected what they were doing. It was this very like orderly, almost like Bauhaus regimented approach to what apps should look like. It was very boring in like the end effect of it. Like everything looked way too similar. Um, but I just thought yeah. consistency was really cool. I think skeuomorphism as an idea is cool because it precedes technology and tech mm-hmm. companies like there was a period in the 70s where cars that were being produced in the 70s were meant to be reminiscent of carriages for like the yeah. uh, silent generation buyers that were nostalgic for when people 
drove around in carriages. Oh, um, wow, that is a, yeah. No, you, I guess, I you, feel like, yeah, that timeline does lightly line up. I, they would have been children at the end of that, but still. Yeah. 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 Cause like even for them too, like they would look at, um, fake chandeliers that had fake candles and they would be like, Oh my childhood. Yeah. So it goes back pretty far. Another example of it though, in the contemporary day is like how, when you're typing on your phone, you hear key- keyboard sounds yeah. um, or typing sounds. That's completely unnecessary. Yeah. I've been called out for that. I forgot to turn it off on my work phone when I got it. And someone's like, how do you live like that? <laughs> the click sounds. And I was like, all right, I'm going to change that now. Um, yeah. But yeah. But yeah, Rafa, do you have any takes on Facebook aesthetics? Because I've had aesthetics other than like um, just corporate Memphis. Right. For the most part, um, within corporate Memphis, I mostly really enjoy the large heads and big limbs and hands and feet of it. I don't know. It's just very fun in a way that I enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Pro corporate Memphis. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the Memphis bit of it, they're referencing the like visual style from the 80s and 90s that I don't know. I'm trying to think of a good like poster child of that, but it was it was less pastels. It was more like bright, almost neon colors. I mean, the jazz cup comes to mind purple and teal those are my high school colors which is how you can tell that my high school was founded in the 90s it's purple and teal as its colors which is so rough but yeah people really look like fondly back upon that because it was like i don't know it was postmodern. it was colorful it was like futurist um in a time where there wasn't too much of a current of that in a lot of ways but yeah 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 i really do like memphis inspired work memphis itself in its own lifetime was recognized as being influential but their own like consumer products that they developed were never really mass market like Mm -hmm. you'll see them in museums but like there's only a few pieces that really became commercially available but the aesthetic of memphis like became popularized on mtv and other like and in other ways too like i feel like nickelodeon's whole aesthetic in the 90s was very memphis mm-hmm. like the rugrats logo even yeah, yeah rugrats <laughs> like yeah out of the box you remember that show I yeah as a kid that had a bit of it zoom was one that was actually oh, before yeah. my but that was like yeah that was from like late 80s or something but thanks to the power of reruns like i was able to watch it as a kiddo but um yeah yeah so next we can move on to the next letter of fang we'll do apple next so from my perspective, Apple's aesthetic has been the most pernicious and influential of all the tech companies. I think its emphasis on clean and minimal aesthetics have translated across disciplines. And it's embedded in consumers' minds the idea that like minimalism equals luxury just because mm-hmm. of them. I'm not a big fan of I use Apple, but like what they've done, I think, to culture has been like a net loss. Yeah. I would say it's like very like it's a well-meaning, it's a very paternalistic thing. I think both Google and Apple share that. Their visual design, uh, a lot of their stuff is influenced by um, Dieter Rams, mm-hmm. the designer for Braun, the like, you know, consumer electronics company that would make like razors and shavers and stuff. And so I think they come from this very like high-minded like respect for the Bauhaus and for legible people-centered design. But it just, I don't know, they're just such like a large power over American culture it feels like you need to actively opt out like it's they've created this opt out system where like you know you have to you have to have an Apple product of some kind I don't know anyone who's like not owned something you know like had an iPod yeah. even an iPod shuffle as a kid you know like we've all somehow graced like come across a yeah. Apple product what's interesting is I think globally at least a few years ago like 80% of the smartphone market was Google which you mm-hmm. don't see in the U.S., but mm-hmm. Apple products, you know, are more expensive. They're harder for people to afford. So I think it's particularly dominant in American culture. To me, it's felt stuck in the same place for pretty much my whole life, mm-hmm. except for my early childhood, because it's hard to think of Apple doing anything different than, like, the note It's it keeps trying to hit over mm-hmm. and over and over mm-hmm. again. But, like, when I was a kid, it produced computers that were part of what were known as the clear craze, which is a word I learned this week because <laughs> mm-hmm. the clear case describes like when you would see like Game Boy advances that would be clear mm-hmm. or semi-transparent and you'd be able to see like the individual components inside of the mm-hmm. device and early Macs, like the early iMacs that came in colors, like 
it's like purple teal. one that stands out to me very clearly in my mind and lime green yeah lime green mm -hmm. my family had two actually growing up because my dad is a professional photographer and he was able to get like a client to buy that for him back when IMAX were like $10,000 oh, yeah. and we had two <laughs> we yeah. had like the blue one and the green one and they always just stood out to me for like how cool they looked mm -hmm. so we don't have to be stuck in this moment that we're stuck in yeah mm -hmm. yeah with the clear craze it was I guess really strong in the 90s like even outside of consumer electronics crystal pepsi yeah there was this idea that I mean this always pops up like Clearness equals like ethics, transparency. This has always been a thing. I mean, we talked about this in the mid-century modernism episode of like glass construction always feeling very open and um, I don't know. Yeah, like this is very elemental, but like the opposite of opaque, like you can see into it. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess regarding that, like if you go back and live in Palo Alto, Steve Jobs used to live in an Eichler those homes are really focused on really clean lines not not at all similar to the designer of braun but still he uh, eichler was a dictator in the same way that jobs is he wanted mm -hmm. all of his homes to be matching in contrasting in a way and determined that like you need to change the color of mm -hmm. this house because it clashes with this neighbor's house in things of that nature mm -hmm. so that sort of top-down design perspective comes from when he used to, you know, work from an Eichler home. Yeah. No, I mean, when the iPhone first came out, like, it, they <laughs> they did not want to have an app store, apparently, was the big discussion from the start. They just didn't trust outside developers to, like, adhere to Apple's design standards at the time and to, like, what they wanted out of the product. But, I mean, eventually, like, you had to at some point. But it's, like, it comes from that thing of, like, the same way that Eichler doesn't trust homeowners to furnish their homes. Jobs didn't trust people to properly use their phones, basically, or developers yeah. to properly develop apps for them. Um, One of the last big antitrust cases in the United States involved IBM, where they were forced through an antitrust suit to decouple computers from software mm. at the time. It could have been like that in our present day, it could have been that like when you buy a technology device, all of the software on it would be proprietary to the company that you purchased it from. Mm -hmm. And this antitrust case was like the last big one really where the U.S. government managed to do something that was good for consumers because <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since they've done yeah. anything that big. Yeah, but fair. yeah, I mean, tech companies always want like increased control mm -hmm. and We'll probably get into more into anti-monopoly stuff later, but I wanted to circle back to the clear cray stuff really mm -hmm. quickly. So when I was learning about that, it made me think about this book from this anthropologist, Michael Taussig, called What Color is the Sacred? And it's a very good book for the first like 50 pages. But then after a while, he starts rambling about shamans <laughs> <laughs> and like the rest of the book is all about shamans. But in the book, he talks about like what color means to Western people and very complex relationships that we have with it. But one of the things that he talks about is that like, as much as people in the West want to convince themselves that like, they like color, that they're comfortable with it. In reality, we always want to confine it to very small portions of like a piece of art or your room or your wardrobe. Mm -hmm. We want it to be controlled and limited. Um, and you see the exact opposite in like non-Western cultures oh, yeah. where like, they like the whole outfit head to toe will be like very bright colors mm -hmm. and their homes, the exteriors of them will be painted like bright yeah. pink, bright yellow. Mm -hmm. And like, that's what's normal to them. Yeah. No, I, uh, I totally fall victim to this. Like you've been in, you guys have been to my apartment. <laughs> um, yeah. All my furniture is white, but I do, I say that I like color and, and the way that I show that is by uh, harnessing it, <laughs> like it to very like limited things like pieces of art or a colorful textile um, or the things on my shelves or place settings. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just totally, yeah, I completely, I'm a Western man in that way. Yeah. Um, one thing about the clear craze that I, I see like the last remnants of that in Apple's design, even though they've, they've gone like full opaque and everything they do, like it's all now they focus on like, Oh, the beauty of our like spun aluminum encasings, but they always show when they release a new piece of tech they do an exploded view of it where they show like all the tiny little components and how they fit together and so it's like they still like 
they kind of want to show you the inside and be like, all right, enough of that. Like it's now sealed up in this like, you know, hermetically sealed thing that if you open it, you void the warranty. <laughs> um, yeah. But they want you to know, like we did all the work ahead of time. Everything's perfect on the inside. Look at it. All right. Now buy it for fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing um, that Michael Taussig brings up in that book is that is that for people in the West, they oftentimes think that if something has a color, they question its authenticity. And so by marketing iPhones as being like, oh, this has a like titanium steel case or this one has aluminum, we like view that as being authentic and we trust the product more. Mm -hmm. He has this quote that touches on it where he wrote that my dictionary goes on to say that color also signifies authenticity or at least character in nature. As in the phrase, he showed us his true colors. Does not the very phrase he showed us his true color he <laughs> He showed us his true colors, venerable with age and usage, also suggests the opposite, that color is both true and untrue precisely because of its claim to authenticity. How can you ever be sure with which variety you're dealing, his true colors or his false ones? Is this why we in the West are drawn to color yet made an easy, even repelled, as by mafia types in Hawaiian shirts? Who of you reading this text would even dream of painting the living room wall bright red or green? any color other than off-white. Then, safe in your whiteness, you can hang a wildly colored picture on the wall, secure in its framed being. Damn, called out. I gotta <laughs> say, that he's got me to a T. Yeah, and in, like, in luxury construction, yeah, we walls are always some kind of off-white. Yeah, even, like, in my own taste, like, even when I do colored things, I often like them to be solid because I don't like to do colored pattern. I like grayscale patterns but then solid colors god i truly am a western man chained to our <laughs> perceptions yeah. of color to wrap up just on that quote um and in thinking about apple's aesthetic quite a lot this week it made me kind of realize that i think that what they're attempting to do with their with their aesthetic is mask their complexity mm -hmm. because the truth is their product it really complicates people's lives and it is involved in like a very complex supply chain and there's nothing like natural or organic about it but by like presenting itself as being like stripped of color and clear and transparent all of these things like try to convince the consumer that like this is trustworthy mm -hmm. and there's nothing to really fear if you buy it yeah they seem to be trying to like sell two things to you one is that like this will change your life and the other thing is that like this will not change your life <laughs> like yeah. things are the same like it's the same you know, glass rectangle you've had in your pocket for the past eight years. Um, yeah. Um, Do you want to go into the headquarters? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Apple's headquarters was like one of the last things that Steve Jobs like put into action before passing. Um, and it took years to build, but it's all complete now. It's where they run, you know, their whole operation out of. It's where they have their keynote addresses. I see it as kind of like one of the final, like, not final, uh, but it's a truly like modernist building in a kind of old school sense uh, where it's, you know, imposing its will upon an area. It's not like, I don't know, trying to fit in to something. It's not trying to fit into an existing city or complement it. It is like truly like the vision of one slash two men. Steve Jobs, of course, but then also Norman Foster, the architect for it of Foster and Partners. It's, it's just a perfect circle. Is the one thing about yeah. it. Everyone calls it like a UFO that's just landed. Um, and it's surrounded by greenery. It has this huge emphasis on nature. It's nature in this very constrained way. I kind of, I, I see it in the same tradition as like Olmstead and Central Park, where it's meant to look wild and unkempt. Like this is Western thought saying like, no, we don't do like meticulous gardens anymore. We try and like make it look natural by meticulously making it look <laughs> natural. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, it's got the clean lines. Uh, <laughs> one of the things they wanted to do was make like uh, zero transitions anywhere. They didn't want any transition strips in terms of flooring elevations. They wanted doors and everything to be seamless so that if you were having a great idea while you were walking, you wouldn't be impeded by a door or something and lose that idea um, that was written down somewhere and everyone makes fun of it because it, it doesn't really trust these like high level 
you know, technical experts that they have. <laughs> yeah. Like it says that they, it treats them as such fragile things that if they're inconvenienced by anything in their existence, like this will threaten the grand project of Apple's design. Yeah. But yeah, I, I did read an article by Alice Becknell where she did mention that Steve Jobs did actually take direct inspiration from Olmsted. So oh. there's definitely that as part of it. Nice. Um, she also referred into... <laughs> In the article to Steve Jobs, or sorry, she referred in the article to Apple's headquarters as being the Garden of Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can see it. Mm-hmm. And in another modernist thing, like it's very car dependent. I mean, yeah, there's a shuttle system, I'm sure, as these companies often have, but they just hide the cars from view. They completely rely on it, but then they also obfuscate it. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of like headquarters in Silicon Valley. They're mostly like suburban parks though, right? It's not like... Yes, for the most part. Um, You know, Sun Microsystems when they were there, um, HP, Hewlett Packard. But obviously the big ones are Google, Facebook, Meta now, um, and then Google. Totally forgot about Netflix, but that's just a small... No, Netflix is like after... We'll we'll get to that one. Oh no, but then just in terms of like the... Oh, it's okay. Ones yeah. around mm-hmm. the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it feels like um, tech company offices in big cities are like a tactical mission. We're like, all right, let's sneak into this city. Let's extract all of its like, <laughs> you know, urban dwelling, like uh, city workers, and then use that knowledge to like fuel our suburban office parks that are our true vision. Um, it's just like, yeah. a, it's like an embassy inside a city for a company. But they're not going to be able to keep all these workers unlocked with all these layoffs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's okay. actually a new thing. So there's like section 147, which essentially um, decides whether R&D software people get to count as an expense or not. And now they're not counted anymore. So they're amateurized. I think within year one, it's like 10% within years two through Five, it's like 20%, and then year six, it's 10%. So it's when did that change? Um, pretty recently with like the tax cuts and jobs act, I think. Um, so I think that was a Trump era initiative. So that's why we're seeing all these layoffs recently. So is this like, is this the industry saying that like hiring with them is fleeting by nature? Yes, yeah, yeah, like hiring is guaranteed, yeah, wow. hiring is always. <laughs> Cyclical. Seasonal, yeah. <laughs> is what they're saying. Within yeah. within tech companies, at least, yeah. Mm-hmm. And no, that's yeah. The way that people are treated. Um, recently, there's like a TikTok where, within Cloudflare, this uh, sales executive was fired within five months of working. Um, yeah, you, I saw that video. Yeah, usually with like ERP systems, I know that takes like years, um, but that's Cloudflare, so that's like. A B2B SaaS that might have a quicker turnaround time. I'm not super familiar with sales, like tech sales, but Dude, I don't know the temperament for that. I don't know how you like tech workers do of like, I don't know, not that we should completely overcorrect and go back to like the company man, like almost Japanese salary man thing mm-hmm. of like working with a company for 45 years. Right. But yeah, because where I work, I work for the city of Chicago. And as a government worker, it's like I have to screw up really badly to get fired. <laughs> And mm-hmm. even then, it's like the limit is like crazy. It's it's basically like I have to be late a lot and then I could get fired and that's about it. But I I mean, I've heard anecdotally of coworkers doing things on the job that are like illegal and not getting fired. I mean, not at my branch, not like where I work, but I've heard mm-hmm. like through other people at other like library locations. And it's like the bar is so high. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, personally, I don't have very much experience with like a really quick hire and fire period. Um, I used to work at a place that was family run and very, very forgiving. Like they had pensions up until like two years ago, essentially. Man. So Rip. in that and a 401k at the same time. So it was like very, and, and they were just very nice for the most part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. That feels super old school. I, I have, have like, I've always, huh, what? I have a pension. Oh yeah. Nice. I, it always, I, it's the right type of paternalism, you know, yeah. like, I want a paternalism that's less like perks oriented. Mm-hmm. I think that has faded from the dialogue a bit. Yeah, um, no, when, they when actually you... they actually are taking away all the perks. People <laughs> are complaining at all the Fang, Manga, whatever it's called now. Those companies they don't 
they don't have any of the snack bars at Google anymore. Oh, if you're non if you're non engineering focused, you get a Chromebook. God forbid you use oh, a Chromebook yeah. instead of a MacBook. Damn. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um no, because that was like what they were known for when these like I don't Google I don't Plex see built, you know? I don't see how Chrome I mean, sorry, I don't see how MacBooks are but right. All right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean I was given one at my job and I felt very nice about it. Yeah, exactly. I, I no. felt like uh you've I'm worth at least uh, $2,500 to you <laughs> as an employee if I yeah. just drop this and shatter it. They're nice to look at. So, yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, Nathan and I are both on our personal little MacBooks <laughs> right now. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, we can wrap up Apple and then we can move on to Amazon. So, I actually don't use Amazon. I boycotted it. I've never had an Not account. I so much respect for that. Yeah, I agree with that in theory, man. But I don't know. Life goes different directions. <laughs> I, yeah. I can't say no to it. I mean, I bet they're becoming less and less competitive. Like, every company yeah. sucks now. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. It's that thing of, like, yeah, lure people in with a really good promise and then just, like, whittle away at the expectations without people noticing. Yeah. yeah. You use Amazon, though, Rafa? Yeah. Yeah, no. I have a family Amazon Prime account that I still use. As oh, a, yeah. I remember what you said about your brother recently. Old, old adult. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, my brother is friends, and he's in college, and he's a freshman in college just goofing around so one of his lesbian friends asked for a vibrator so i just <laughs> so i see a vibrator on the family amazon account <laughs> and just immediately talk shit to him um because oh, your dad saw it probably <laughs> yeah no my dad sees everything but like yeah no i mean i i buy tons of like weird skincare off amazon so it's like I think it's the bluest we've gotten on this podcast. I think we've been pretty buttoned down. Bluest? You ever heard that? It's in comedy. Like, blue comedy is, like, inappropriate or vulgar stuff. Oh, yeah. No. Mm -hmm. I I really don't talk about anything. (laughs) Yeah, you you don't personally, but you love to goad other people into it, which I think is very tactful. Yeah, I wanted to tell us that on air. I wanted to hear that. Um, But, yeah, so I don't use Amazon myself, but I, I do look at their website periodically. Like, for example... I'm about to be doing like a workshop on Joseph Cornell in like two, three weeks. And as part of that, I had to like gather supplies for that. And um, I like had to look at Amazon. And so I, I've used the interface before. I've like looked at products and haven't bought them for myself, but like through organizations, they bought them for me. And my perception of it is that it's sort of reminiscent of like Trump's Make America Great Again hats, which at first, the first time you hear that, you might be like, what are you talking about? But it's not in the sense of like literally like the aesthetics match each other one to one. But there's something about the Amazon aesthetic where I feel like it's designed in a way to make you look at it and not think that it's a luxury site and to mm-hmm. not exclude anyone upon initially viewing it from being like, OK, I don't know if I can afford this. I think anyone who looks at it will look at it and be like, this is cheap. <laughs> and to me, it's not pretty, but because it's not overly beautiful it gives off that like flavor of like the make america great again hats yeah it's like um i say that, like with web design specifically if you're on like very high fashion websites uh it's just almost unusable their websites like they're like kind of just broken and hard to navigate and so minimalist that it's like obtrusive to the user experience yeah and it's like showing off its uselessness basically it's like how it's like very difficult to like get an F1 car to even start, you know, it's like this arcane process. It's like the bar is so high. It feels like that is a thing in higher end. Like you want to show off how like, uh, cumbersome it is. And Amazon is the opposite. It's just like, here's everything you want. It ain't pretty, but we got it all here. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. Amazon, part of it feels like it's addressing like a key need that's existed since mail order catalogs in the late 1800s in America. Like, there's always going to be a semi-nationalized kind of just place to order things. Um, but that used to exist in harmony with like actual physical retail. And Amazon is just chipping away at just the need for stores in general. I, I have a fear that once once they crack the legal side of drone delivery, that's like the... I think the engineering side of drone delivery is not as hard as the legal side of yeah. tons of independent you know, flying vehicles across like yeah. common airspace. What pisses me off too, is I feel like NIMBYs will be fine with that for some reason. Yeah. Like they'll be okay with that. Cause, but it's mm-hmm. going to create like 
noise pollution for oh, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're going to be fine with that. But if you tried to build mm-hmm. like, you know, a light rail line a few blocks from the house, they'd freak out. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, yeah, people are okay with like very obtrusive things in their daily life if it does like deliver some kind of material good to them directly and seamlessly. Um, I just, I don't know, I like the idea of having stores. <laughs> I, I think that if they crack, yeah, drone delivery, that'll be the end of physical stores. <laughs> yeah, I'm personally completely bearish on drone delivery. I don't see it happening ever. Like if drones fail and it hits a car and then that car plows into a small child or something, mm-hmm. it's just a complete non-starter. Yeah. I always think about that with um, self-driving cars. I'm like, why are companies so gung ho to take on all this liability and responsibility? Like it feels like it's like for car companies, they've always had this like outsourcing of responsibility. The car companies will say, you know, we'll comply with all the safety standards that the government enforces on us, you know, and then the rest is up to the end user. We can only do so much. Um, but then as Tesla tries to expand this like self-driving uh, division, which they've had to like, back off of now because things were not as self-driving as they were claiming. I just don't know why they're opening themselves up to so much litigation. I guess you can always make the end users like click some agreements saying that they assign their lives away. Yeah. Um, But it's just like wandering into a minefield. I mean, that's a really good point about like why we as a society sort of are okay with like, like car deaths and like car crashes Mm -hmm. because it does export the liability to individual people. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a, like the big reason why there's this race to get like fully autonomous vehicles is just because it's a rat race, sort of like AI where it's like, we kind of see an end, but like not really. And mm-hmm. we just want to have control. <laughs> yeah. It's all about mm-hmm. control. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's mostly just a, a friction thing. There's an inherent friction when you drive, like the, the, uh, the guy in falling down is just sitting in stop and go traffic if he was playing candy crush on his phone (laughs) you know because you have level four autonomous driving in your in your bends i think that's the Mm -hmm. only one with level four autonomous driving then that completely alleviates you because i think mercedes benz does accept all responsibility when you do that but you're only allowed to do that while on the freeway which is which is interesting in itself that's wild i didn't know that mercedes was like the top in that it's always interesting when like a very old company kind of shoots ahead in one area it just shows that they were smart and they saw that like if they didn't shoot ahead on something they were gonna be left behind by like the more upstart minded companies like tesla yeah um not to be a mercedes stan or anything um, mm-hmm. yeah I'm, I'm not entirely sure what qualifies as level four versus level three mm-hmm. but it's it's an interesting 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 race that they're doing yeah, it was yeah. there was a good uh, Strong Towns podcast episode, uh, the podcast Upzone. They were talking about push to autonomous vehicles and how it requires that we like mold our built environment around to make them more orderly and make them you know make the urban fabric more predictable and standardized, which is not something that's needed when it's just people to people interactions. You know, like yeah, when you take cars out of the equation, like I think we've talked about how like Nathan you don't like the look of bike infrastructure, which is fair. It is a lot of like high visibility bollards and raised things. And like, it's just a lot of visual like clutter. And what bike (laughs) advocates always say is that that isn't bike infrastructure. That's car infrastructure to protect cyclists from cars. Yeah. Um, Because when you do take cars out of the equation, like, I don't know, a cyclist and a pedestrian given enough space and enough like uh, time between them, they're not going to hit each other because there's kind of just like a person to person, I'll step out of the way, you slow down deal. But cars like throw that whole thing out the window and especially self-driving cars where they need every stop sign to be hyper visible. If there's any snow covering like a crosswalk that could really make things dicey. It just requires you to like very like cordon off every zone of a city for a particular use. Yeah. So, I mean, our cities it's hard enough to just do anything with (laughs) yeah we're not gonna they're not gonna convince like local government officials to dedicate more resources to standardizing the environment i think that's farther down the line like they'll have to just deal with it for now (laughs) but um but yeah to circle back to amazon we they have like they do have a headquarters that's worth talking about i one of my favorite artists is this artist named hiroshiro She's like a German Japanese artist and she like 
writes and gives these really great lectures. Her ideas are like very complex, but she has this talk that she gave called Bubble Vision. And as part of that, she addresses Amazon's headquarters in Seattle. The buildings are geodesic domes called biospheres, which are home to over 300 plant species. And she uses the buildings as an example of how the role of humans in the environment has been inverted over the course of the Anthropocene. She said that the Amazonian forest has become inserted into a bubble and preserved as a corporate headquarters, as a biosphere, which is isolated from natural environments. Yeah, that's something that pops up in like different cyberpunk visions of the future is that nature is always, you know, respected in theory by people, but we'll go and destroy it where it actually is. But then we'll like scrape it out of the ground and preserve it as a status symbol. Um, yeah. Like access to nature becomes like fetishized. I think I see that now with like how every like New York stockbroker also has a home in Jackson Hole. Wyoming and has suddenly acquired this like appreciation for beauty yeah. and nature and like the raw. They also might be there though because they want to like do it old. They want to do it. Old. They want to do oil drilling in their backyard. <laughs> yeah, maybe they are. Like, yeah, like, I think RuPaul got accused of that actually. Yeah, because RuPaul <laughs> yes. has like a ranch in Wyoming. Yeah, were, yeah, yeah. He sold the like drilling rights to someone. <laughs> yeah, why do yeah. I know that? Jeez, it's okay that you know about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's become this like it's a status symbol to have the home in Jackson Hole and to like be out there appreciating it. It's just very interesting that it's like there's such a there's a more of a connection between like Jackson Hole to Midtown Manhattan than there is from like a small town outside of Jackson Hole to a town over in Col like elsewhere in Colorado. Like there's a a stronger yeah. bond between those places. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of like the headquarters of the various tech companies that we've looked at this week, I do think theirs looks the coolest, but also at the same time, I do think that like echo futurism is, mm -hmm. it kind of is like a gimmick. I mm -hmm. mean, it is a gimmick. Yeah. It's like a way for you to like be convinced that a building is pretty if you just put some trees on it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, you can call it greenwashing basically. Yeah. I also always love the term blob blob contexture. It's something yeah. that's easier typed than said, um, but it is like the name for Zaha Hadid style um, statement architecture where everything is sinewy and like you know crazily blob shaped. <laughs> so yeah, it also comes also like curved. Karim Rashid. You familiar with him? No, I'm surprised. I feel like maybe I am. Want to see a photo? You right. you should Google him because like he's very well known um, and he's an architect that you'd probably Sorry. find cool. You can type; it's fine. Yeah, but what's the? Oh, Karim Rashid. <laughs> Are you seeing his stuff? He's he's both like an interior designer and an architect, but oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that sure. His style yeah. is more Y two K, like Zaha Hadid. I would yeah. say her work is definitely more like cyber. Yeah. What would you call it? Neo futurist or? Um, you can't call it postmodernist. Like, I guess you could just call it like yeah. contemporary, but that's like, yeah, that's, that's only making an assessment of the time that it's happening. Nothing about it's, um, yeah. I mean, I do like, nature. I do like both of them. Um, mm -hmm. Zaha Hadid obviously is not like designing for walkable. I mean, are, maybe she is designing for walkable communities, mm -hmm. but I, I, I mean, that doesn't match me or my life, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I've always liked Zaha Hadid's work. I think it's really Yeah, cool. I, I respect it as, like, yeah. Yeah, as architecture. But it is, like, as I get more into, like, the strong towns ethos of, like, oh, a town built by many small hands, buildings that respect each other. These are buildings that muscle in front of other buildings and show, like, look at how yeah. much our local government was willing to give us <laughs> <laughs> to make this. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, at look, we're competitive. It's the... um. The Bilbao effect of where like the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao like rocketed this sleepy post-industrial Spanish city into like the upper echelons of art thanks to a really zany building. Yeah, um, it's like um, Chuck on Strong Towns on one of the episodes on Upzoned, he was talking with someone about how like you know buildings in a city like not all of them could can be having their wedding day like think of it as a <laughs> yeah. wedding. It's like one of them needs to stand out. And like, mm -hmm. depending on the era, it could be the church, it could mm -hmm. be the town hall yeah. or the city hall, or it could be like the, a financial building. But yeah, if, if every building in the town is trying to be like, no, I'm different, yeah. it's going to suck. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to it not is. look good. No, actually, if we can use it as a chance to hop over to Google Talk for a bit. Yeah. Um, 
So Google has bought the Thompson Center in downtown Chicago, which was built in the late 80s, early 90s, I'm just going to say, and not research it, uh, by Helmut Jan, noted postmodern architect. Um, it's a interesting building. It gets hated on a lot, but a lot of people, I think most of Chicago is settled upon a kind of begrudging respect for the building because it is awe-inspiring when you walk in. It's got a gigantic atrium. The atrium is so tall and poorly conditioned that clouds form in it on <laughs> summer days. Yeah. Um, but it was built out of what we talked about earlier, like in the clear era, this idea of transparency. Um, this is when like, go I mean, governments are always trying to convey that they nowadays that they are not corrupt, that they are open to the people, that this is like a modern agora, like a marketplace yeah. or like it's this, this building should be as open to like the people of Illinois, like as any other building. And this is so, like, in contrast to, like, Chicago City Hall, which is this, like, muscular Greco-Roman, like, just in Which is across the street, the too. Yeah, it's like directly across the street. Yeah. And, like, that is from the era of, like, consolidated power and political graft. Um, yeah. But there was more, like, kind of owning it, in a sense. It was like, yeah, this building should make you feel small. You are small. <laughs> you are a citizen. We yeah. are the government. We're more, it's, like, with the Thompson Center, it's more of, like, a come inside like everything's yeah. all right because you couldn't you can look inside the building too from like the l station nearby yeah mm -hmm. and like yeah but that's it. a very like brilliant parallel to draw i would not have connected the clear craze to that helmet yon building oh, but i can totally watch. see it <laughs> <laughs> and so tech companies are trying to borrow from that same thing nowadays google has always had this statement of like uh don't be evil Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think that they're buying this old government building from the 90s that was trying to convey its lack of evil. And now Google's buying it and they're fixing it up. And that itself is a gesture of goodwill to the city of Chicago of like, hey, they were going to tear this down. Instead, we're going to zhuzh it up. We're going to make it even more open is one thing they're yeah. talking about. They want to make more of the space public. But they're also trying to like, yeah, get some I look forward to that. from it. Oh, yeah. No, anything's better. It's a fun building. There's a Taco Bell in the basement, or there used to be. I hope they don't get rid of that. <laughs> yeah, it used to um, feel like Jurassic Park in the basement. Like, because <laughs> somewhere in the 90s, they started to put some greenery down there and like vines, and it just always felt like Rainforest Cafe slash um, yeah. Mall. Jurassic Park to me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, on Google, uh, their aesthetic, I mean, of these companies, they kind of have the least of an aesthetic because like they're. Um, what their their product is so ubiquitous it's like you're searching you're mm -hmm. just looking for other stuff mm -hmm. but i mean the logo of the company is very childish and it reminds me of like education and primary colors mm -hmm. i once was having a conversation with a sister where she was saying anecdotally like oh yeah the first time i went on google.com it was like such a joke like i looked at her <laughs> and i laughed like no one thought it was going to be as big as it got yeah. because like i mean the logo now even if you like kind of think about it and you're like oh if i was looking at it for the first time mm -hmm. it's kind of silly but yeah. back in the day like google.com when it first came out mm -hmm. was like it was well, like it had the garish. serif font it yeah. had a semi like 3d look to it it had they yeah. had like a shadow gradient on it to make it feel like the letters were popping out again yeah. this is pretty great flattening but yeah if yeah. you try and look at it with fresh eyes you're like oh that's a funny word and they made all the letters a different color this is a funny thing <laughs> like yeah it, yeah but now it's just like we're so like used to it that just yeah. reads as regular do, do you think that google has an aesthetic rafa um for the most part yeah it's the same as every other company aesthetic with the flat design the headquarters quarters itself in mountain view is just very college campusy just a lot of spread out buildings yeah, I looked up their headquarters and it didn't stand out to me. Yeah, I mean, it was made pretty long ago in the 90s, so... Yeah. It's like the first wave of this, like, style of new suburban campus. Yeah. So it's showing its age now as, like, I don't know, other people have caught up to it. Yeah. Remember that movie they made where Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson were interns at Google? Yep. This was a full feature length film that was just like an advertisement for Google. I yeah. never saw that or heard of no, it. No, no, <laughs> no one like watched it. They yeah. completely bombed. Like you got to give the American people some credit. They were able to see that and be like, no, <laughs> they don't want to watch this thing. But it was focused on the perks, as we had mentioned earlier. Right. Um, the perks that are slowly yeah. or yeah. Which, being taken away. I, can, I, I, I am a fan of some light paternalism from a company. My mom talked about it. She worked for just like a very boring company in the loop in Chicago in the 90s. And they had like three square meals a day. And they had pensions yeah. and 401ks. Like it was just kind of an agreement between worker and company that like you give us yeah. everything, we'll give you everything. That's like the one thing that like me as a government worker, I always feel like 
sad that I miss out on is like free food because <laughs> I maybe get free food like once a year when we go to like all staff development mm-hmm. and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so I miss also, out in that way. Yeah. Um, it's crazy that like a lot of basements and buildings are like for city workers because no like yeah. for profit private company would put their would stick their like employees in the basement. They're like, oh, no, that's too yeah. much. Um, but suddenly when they're government workers, like, I ah, yeah, stick them down there. They can't ask otherwise. <laughs> well, you know that because you saw where my boyfriend works, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. uh, which actually he had to just move. There's this whole ruckus going on where basically all the aldermen, they did not want to renew leases on buildings that the city didn't own downtown. And so city workers now are having to be like relocated to all of these other government buildings that like are in neighborhoods throughout the city, which are not convenient for like everyone in the same yeah, way the odds that you'd be, downtown works. Yeah, dude, the loop yeah. exists for a reason. It's just like the one yeah. thing it can do is reliably get people down there. Yeah, like it's I know- the one place we've agreed that this is where business happens. Yeah, like a lot of the health department, they were in the basement of the DePaul Center. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are being relocated to like a building in Pilsen. It's like if I was relocated from there to Pilsen, I would be like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, I get the appeal. Like, yeah, yeah, cool if you're in Pilsen. <laughs> yeah, that's like... No, it's, it's not in the otherwise. sense of like, I don't like Pilsen. It's just in the sense yeah. of like, you know, all of the CTL lines go through downtown. That is like the most convenient place to mm-hmm. go to in the city for pretty much everyone. Mm-hmm. And so for like, for me to reroute from where I live to Pilsen, I, it would be kind of inconvenient. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so... We've gotten through F A A G, you know what that spells. But <laughs> anyways, um, the one that we're missing is Netflix. Um, so let's circle back to Netflix. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Netflix is unique. It's just not really. It was a platform, and they do a lot of great open source software work. But it's just very completely different. Now it's essentially the same as any other uh, production agency, mm-hmm. HBO, or. Um, NBC it's just they make content and they do some hard data engineering work but for the most part it's like it's mostly just making great content yeah Yeah. I mean I didn't really realize that there was such a prevalent aesthetic across all like Netflix originals until I was researching for this week and I encountered a 2022 Vice article where they pointed out something that's called the Netflix look and so largely because like each Netflix show, when they're getting their show like approved, they make contracts where they then all use the same like camera equipment. And like when I think about Netflix, I actually am a bit of a Netflix hater. I, <laughs> I don't like watch that many shows on it, even though I like will go on it regularly and hope that there's something I want to watch. There rarely is. But like the shows that I watch, like Black Mirror, they break from that formula. Yeah. Um, the standard Netflix formula like does not work for me. Well, it's like a prestige thing, right? You need some prestigious TV shows that break the mold, but for the most part, what you're looking for is engagement and stickiness, yeah. right? So people talk about like content versus like actual good media. You know, it's like you need to have your prestige stuff to get the like, reputation that comes with that, and then you also need just enough content for people to consume. Basically, yeah. the love is blind kind of stuff. Yeah. I feel like HBO, though, as a as a as a platform, they're kind of all prestige content, yeah, uh-huh. which is I think, why I gravitate a bit more towards them. Yeah, they're like afraid of brand dilution. I would say they're not releasing stuff like MILF Manor, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who released that? I'm trying to think. I don't know. But it's it's one of those classic things like, oh, hey, like 30 Rock predicted this because 30 Rock had MILF Island on it. Yeah. But yeah, MILF Manor is I forget who's brought that into this world. Um, but yeah, watch, and it, so that, watch it was Disney Channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're making, they're trying to. Yeah, Disney Plus <laughs> is trying to appeal to the whole family. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's like the, there's a, a very consistent look across all their live action stuff. Um, but they also have like adult animation, and, yeah. And which I've like turned away. From, I was a big like Adult Swim kid growing up. I would watch an old CRT monitor I had in my. You were the Family Guy. Oh, yeah. Like, as any, like, <laughs> child was, too, was like, at yeah, that I watched point. a lot yeah. of those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I remember watching, like, old episodes of, um, or, like, when the Eric Andre show first came out, watching that on a small little CRT TV felt so right. That show is, like, especially the first season, which was, like, filmed, like, on on film. <laughs> yeah. Or, like, on a camcorder or something. It feels right to watch it on, like, a not nice TV. It's kind of fucked up to see it, at, like, <laughs> on a 55-inch OLED or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've never liked um, Netflix animation. 
the only like Netflix animation show I've watched, um, and that was maybe only a few episodes, was Chicago Party Ant. <laughs> yeah, so that was like a Twitter account first that got a show deal, which sounds so messed up. Like that should not yeah. be the like where content comes from. It's yeah, that, that's happened before. Line. It's like yeah. shit my dad says. Yeah, no, that's, that was the next thing I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, you know, there is the show that I don't like that's also a Netflix animation called like Midnight Gospel. And that was like oh, a yeah. podcast um, that they turned into a show, yeah. um, which makes me think about like how far can a podcast go? Um, <laughs> yeah, Midnight Gospel. I know like JG Quintel was involved in it. Who's like the guy from... I don't even care about getting this right. He's either the guy from Regular Show, or maybe there's some people yeah, from I think it was Adventure regular Time show. also involved in it. But it does very much seem like just like stoner content, yeah. which I will tolerate to a certain degree um, off the air. It it's not realistic. Show. That was the vibe I got because <laughs> my I had an ex who really liked that, and he showed me like Midnight Gospel and really wanted me to like it, oh, and I was immediately like, no, 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 bad vibes. Like <laughs> this is nihilistic. But I, I had to watch a few episodes mm-hmm. begrudgingly. It's just like DMT content. It's just people talking about how like opening your third eye and like, yeah. on, which I, I get in theory, but I think I'm maybe a little too. What's there to get that. in theory? There's nothing to get in theory. <laughs> uh, that there's like a world outside of our own that we need to like lightly open our minds to see. That's called go to church. <laughs> yeah. But then the end of it is that like, oh, but the way you see that is through substances, and it's like I don't know. That's always been kind no, of no. It's through church. Me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like. I don't know. It's like these substances are just like plants, defense mechanisms to make us not eat them. And then you eat them and then you see something wild and you try and ascribe it to like meaning. Yeah. It just doesn't, I don't know. I'm a little Have you seen Midnight Gospel, Rafa? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. We've seen Bojack Horseman. That's the next thing. Oh, right. Yeah. But that's a prestige TV thing. It's like, look, we can do something sad. It's a depressed guy being Mm self-destructive. Yeah. And, the horse uh, is self-destructive. Yeah, yeah. He's Why? just he's a sex, <laughs> he's a sex pest, and um, he just does too many drugs without thinking about what the consequences yeah. might be, you know, yeah. in his life, and he annoys well, the people. Well, around ketamine him. is for horses, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. There are a lot of jokes about like the quantity of uh, stuff that he consumes because he is a horse. And that does make me chuckle a little bit. And it's just a very like <laughs> yeah, simple thing of like, it yeah. would be funny if a horse lived among us and he would yeah. drink large amounts of alcohol. But I think that that shows an example of like lower people's expectations and then clear them very high. You know, like if you frame the show as like, oh, it's got animal people in it. But like, oh, we actually like have a very nuanced understanding of like self-destructive tendencies and like how the entertainment world chews people up. It's there would be higher expectations of the show if it was live action. Um, but I think if it was live action, it would just be Californication from my understanding as someone who hasn't seen all of Bojack Horseman and hasn't seen any of Californication. I'm going to make that from the hip assessment. That's about like a sex pest self-hating guy. I think so. In Hollywood. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is also, I don't know. I'm always fascinated by, um, when, actors hew too closely to like their character because David Duchovny is has been open about his sex addiction and I'm watching Mad Men and at the end of Mad Men like the John Hamm who plays Don Draper like actually had to check into rehab for alcoholism and that's like one of the themes of Mad Men I just don't I don't know how people pull off that like (laughs) yeah that disconnect of like going to work playing someone who's like a bottom of the barrel alcoholic and then going home and then being a bottom of the barrel alcoholic (laughs) I don't know it just sounds uncreative is what I'd say yeah, I mean, I feel like if I was ever to act in anything, I would have to be typecasted. But, like, what in the world would I ever be typecasted for? <laughs> you are like, a little... Yeah, you're an iconoclast. You're like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't fit in any molds. But, yeah. yeah, I'm, like, not an emotional person, and <laughs> I wouldn't be a good fit for acting in mm. any way. Yeah. I'm also, like, super robotic. Like, I have... <laughs> Yeah, it's just gonna work. It's so good to know that about yourself. That's <laughs> yeah. just like it's once you own that, like once you know those things. But it's like yeah. how I've said, like I'm not down to earth. I don't think. I, I think I'm like contr- you're concerned. not chill. Is that no? What you I don't mean? think I'm chill. I don't think yeah, I'm down either. to earth. Um, I don't. I, other people they can do that. Like I live the way I do, so they don't have to. You know? Yeah. No, I'm like I was once described by someone as being like 
one of those fruits in the Amazon that has like 40 times the amount of vitamin C as an orange. <laughs> it's like, I Too can much. see it. Yeah. It's like, no, you, you try me once mm-hmm. and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking about how like if I had kids, um, I think I'd be really stern with them. And someone's like, no, you wouldn't be. And I'm like, I'm stern with you. <laughs> I'm stern with my friends. Like I scold people sometimes then I have to apologize because I like ask so much of the people around me. Um, yeah. Would you ever change your lifestyle like Stanislavski method acting? for a role if you were offered mm-hmm. such a role yeah i don't even think it would work like <laughs> i can't like i have a hard enough time just like being no i don't i don't mean this in the way that it's gonna sound like but i have a hard enough time being me in my day-to-day life yeah. that like yeah the burden of being someone else it's like i'm already trying to control my gay list but, like <laughs> <laughs> you're juggling like spinning five plates at once i yeah. would just like bradley cooper's obsession with the um leonard cohen Leonard Bernstein biopic that he did. Um, it was a post recently about how like he wants there to be like a most effort put into a movie award, which is just really funny because he's you know he's asking for a participation trophy. There's a lot yeah. to line there, um, but I would love to give that treatment to Pete Seeger, the folk singer. I'm like obsessed with him <laughs> and his whole story, and I think we have enough phenotypical overlap that I could play him in a future thing. But I also look up to him because he like. He's like a pure, he had no struggles with anything. Like he's just known by everyone as just like a purely good person. Yeah. Um, I don't know. He's like almost like not relatable. The reason there hasn't been a good movie about him made yet is because he didn't have any struggles with like w- womanizing or drugs or drinking. He was just like yeah. married for 80, for, for 60 years. Yeah. And like <laughs> I, I used to read... Um, Rolling Stone growing up, which is weird to say, like, why would I do that? Mm. It's because my dad, for some reason, that was, like, the only magazine we were Mm. subscribed to. But I remember every single, like, interview they would do with every single celebrity, it would basically be like, okay, so how are you bad? How are you a bad boy? Or how are you a bad Mm -hmm. girl? Like, (laughs) I don't know. I feel like if I was ever interviewed in that kind of context, I would be like, no. Like, I don't... I'm a good boy. (laughs) Yeah, I don't do that. (laughs) I'm not trying to. I mean, I do... I do sin. There are things that I do that are bad, yeah. but yeah, it's not like that. <laughs> yeah, you compartmentalize. Okay, but we should get back to topic. So mm-hmm. we're done discussing Fang. Sorry for that hour-long soliloquy, <laughs> Rafa. Um, huh? No, I don't. I love Fang. <laughs> but they, no, they now we're going to get to talk about you more. I'm I'm very boring and uninteresting. I I don't know. You're an emissary into the world. I mean, maybe tech. you're a product of your where you grew up then. True, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you consider um, Silicon Valley boring? Um, for the most part, yeah. Um, it's mostly just uh, like a bedroom community for the most part. And mm-hmm. So specifically like San Jose? San Jose especially. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are some cool pockets because it's an American suburb, so everything is not balkanized, but, you know, separated out yeah, into its component parts. I mean, I, I used to grow up in like the very Vietnamese, Mexican part of San Jose mm-hmm. in Evergreen. But you're Filipino. Yeah, I'm Filipino. Mm-hmm. Important the, for viewers, listeners to know. <laughs> right, right. And then there, there was like a pretty big Filipino contingent as well. But it's interesting in seeing like how much they, you know, love singing in that middle school there during the talent show versus going to Palo Alto High School where people are, you know, nose to their books. They're looking at Stanford as their top target college and then doing everything they can to make the world a better place and fulfill their needs that way, you know? And then you also have trust fund kids who just get high all day, which is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, yeah. I went to a predominantly like Asian high school, not, 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 not numbers wise majority, but very cultures wise majority. They like ran the culture of the school, I would say, but there were just like rich white kids just zanning out there as well. <laughs> like it was like, yeah, yeah it, like, Asian, like, Filipino kids, like, trying to get into Ivy League schools and then just, like, yeah, a zanned out white child in the corner. <laughs> there weren't any white kids trying to get into Ivy League schools? No, 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 there were. Yeah, there yeah. were, like, Mormon kids who were very high achieving and then there were, like, I don't know, odd one out, like, yeah, very motivated white kids. But, like, if, if you took the white kids in my school and took out the Mormons and the Jews, like, <laughs> there were, like, very little actual high achieving ones. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. yeah, I've always like this is I always made this off the cuff like observation about Sun Belt cities, and the West Coast is that it attracts like the lazy whites from like real hardworking cities like 
you know, Chicago or like Pittsburgh. Like the ones that don't want to pay taxes. Yeah, the ones who are like, mm, it's too cold here and I have to work in a factory. I want to like, <laughs> I want to be where it's warm all the time um, and less is asked of me. And I don't need to like, I don't know, befriend my neighbors and ask them to help me shovel out of the snow in the winter. Yeah, it's a yeah. self selection thing. Yeah. yeah. I like never shovel snow, even though like I kind of want to. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I because I didn't like grow up doing it. It's like a fun novelty for me. I have like a method for it. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, on Silicon Valley, I remember like many, or not that long ago. It was a few years ago, but I was on Twitter back when I had Twitter, and I saw this meme that like I don't think I'll ever be able to find again. But basically, it said that like never has a place had such unimaginable wealth and looks so ugly. Sorry, Rafa. But it was a picture of San Jose. And I do think there's something to that, though, where it's like, if you th think about how much money the Bay Area has, specifically Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and like what the place looks like, <laughs> it's not like utopia. Even though they have the wealth to potentially build utopia, I mean, they have more money than anyone else. Yeah, it should look like a 2000s bad CGI rendering of the future, <laughs> where it is yeah. like trees in bubbles and like chrome skyscrapers and stuff, but it doesn't really look like that. Yeah. I mean, part of the reason why defaulting to my strong town, uh, <laughs> strong town's roots is like, you know, of course, they have a lot of sprawl, the amount they have to pay on concrete and asphalt to get to and from the places takes away a lot of the money that they would have to spend on those places. Mm -hmm. But it sucks though. It's like, I wish it was this sort of like amazing utopia mm -hmm. that I couldn't even think of. And yeah. it was a destination that I wanted to go to. And yeah. Yeah. San Jose is like architecture is so bad. It's like mentioned in the Wikipedia article. It says that like the lack of like visual variety and like things to look at. It's been like brought up by citizens of the community. Like how bad do you have to bungle that for that to be like mentioned under the like <laughs> architecture yeah. part of your Wikipedia article? Yeah. And the Wikipedia page too. You know how every city when you go to it, there's like a good set of like nine photos or maybe a little bit more mm -hmm. or less of like their best things. Yeah, like yeah. for Chicago, you'll see like Millennium Park and the Art Institute. But for them, like one of their pictures is this hotel it's from just, the 1930s, the Hotel de Anza. And it's like, that's that's one of your crowning achievements is this <laughs> hotel from the 30s. Yeah, it looks as pretty as like, because um, in Chicago, we have these like 1920s Venetian style like hotel buildings and they're very pretty, but they're just like a dime a dozen. Like there's one in every neighborhood yeah. and they get turned to apartments a lot of times like you just walk past them but in san jose like look at this beauty of <laughs> 1920s excellence like yeah yeah i just i feel bad for him yeah. i mean i like that that hotel's there it's just they mm -hmm. should build more hotels that look yeah. better you should build enough that that hotel becomes irrelevant yeah. yeah yeah but like the commute culture of the bay area is bizarre san jose is a larger population than san francisco yeah um, it's just Due to you know how small San Francisco is. Yeah, yeah San only, like, Francisco so is land. like fifty square miles. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the Sunset District, like I think it was Feinstein and Jerry Brown were like, no more building, and it's just very flat, mm -hmm. very boring, one two flat. Yeah, buildings, but, and it could look a lot better. Just you would hate it. The streets are so wide, and it's very boring. But that that that's talking about San Francisco, not the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. The Bay Area itself is very just spread out all along the foothills of um, the peninsula, right? Because there is like a pretty large, uh, pretty large hills um, that separate that out from the uh, the ocean and, and the beaches, like where Santa Cruz might be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm totally blanking on the highway. <laughs> no, it's okay. And then like with the commuting thing, like it's, you get the tech job and the idea is like, all right, which like, you know, I now I need to live somewhere where I can like, you know, be close enough to commute. And there's like the, the shuttle system, but there's also, we'd mentioned in the show notes, like not the show notes in the docket, um, people like live out of their vans. Yeah. And so stuff. they've cracked down on that or is that still happening? Yeah. I, I've watched a video on YouTube of a guy who's like, here is my van set up so that I can like, you know, work at Google. Right. Um, no. So it's, it's a little twofold because there are these people who do, askew you know having to pay for like a mobile home sp spot and they just live they just they just park on el camino right by like stanford stadium in the palo alto high school 
and just lived out lived out there. Um, I think they stopped around 2020 when COVID happened, but it was like for a good straight 10 years. Mm-hmm. The the fun thing to do was just like go to the Walmart and just live in an RV essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so was it the city who cracked down on this? Um, it- I'm not sure. This happened as I like moved to Chicago mm-hmm. and I graduated school, so I was mostly focused yes. on that. But I think it was mostly just like way too many people just occupying uh el camino real (laughs) it's so funny to think about like you know tech billionaire squatters not they're not billionaires sorry like you know just very high earning tech workers living out of vans now Um, because the style of thinking like that's encouraged by these tech companies is like min max find efficiency how can you get the most out of the least and all that and then they act shocked when they're they ask that of their employees and their, their employees start living in vans in order to like not spend anything on housing. It's just like they encourage it. It happened. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, with people who work in tech, I've never really understood their drive to get so much money because from my perspective, their lives don't have that much beauty. And that's like the, the point of wealth yeah. is like, if you amass like a million dollars, you shouldn't live in a place that like looks generic and all the walls are white and all Mm -hmm. the floors are like that, like, uh, plastic wood. That's gray. (laughs) LVT. LVT. Luxury vinyl tile. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. It's like, I don't know, but on like commuting, there is like a transit agency in San Jose, which is probably the worst in the country, (laughs) given the resources that are spent on it. It's called VTA. I think it's Valley transit authority, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, they have like a bus system and then there's also a light rail system. The light rail system was pretty poorly designed. Uh, it's all like street running. There's a lot of right angles where they have to do like turns and none of it's grade separated. So like you're not going to be saving time over driving at any point of Mm -hmm. your trip. And luckily though, there are plans to extend the BART from the current uh, Termini in Berryessa because they're going to build like four stations, three of them underground. And it's one of the best like public transit expansion projects proposed in the country. Like yeah. it's going to get like 50,000 new riders per day. Whoa. Um, That's a small list also of like transit expansions in the U.S. Is no, like- <laughs> it's a big list if you include like BRT. Yeah. But like, I mean, yeah, in terms of heavy rail, which is what subways are, yeah. um, although heavy rail is what you say because like, not all systems are underground. Like Chicago is, is not a subway. Most of it's above ground. Yeah. But yeah, that's what you call it, heavy rail. And yeah, there's only two current systems where they're building heavy rail. It's like Honolulu and Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And then there's plans for like Chicago, New York City, and San Jose to start mm-hmm. building um, heavy rail expansions in the next few years. Yeah. But yeah, San Jose is, makes me excited because I think it's like what will save BART, if anything. Is BART in trouble? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're like, I I think they're at like only 30% of pre-COVID levels with their public transit ridership. Jeez, man. (laughs) Yeah. That's good to know, you know, that Chicago is not alone in some, some struggling in the (laughs) public transit sphere. It also shows just how useful the system is. It's like, BART system is really only set up for going to and from work. Um, Chicago system, like like I I can use it on my like lunch breaks to go to like a different Mm -hmm. restaurant if I Mm -hmm. want. Like you well, can it's do still that. mostly focused on the loop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Chicago's. What do you mean? Chicago's. Yeah, we're still we're still a hub and spoke model, you know. But yeah, there's but, enough along the spokes, you know, that it yeah, makes Yeah, there's sense. like 150 stations, yeah. which is the second most mm-hmm. in the country. Yeah. And like, or like, sorry, I haven't worked in the loop in like a year, I think. But right. at my last library I was at, I would take like the train to Chipotle, and then I'd take <laughs> the train back. And like yeah. with BART, I can't imagine that working. No, yeah, you are right on that. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's actually, I think, 27 separate Bay Area as a whole transit agencies. Jesus. And then within the Silicon Valley Peninsula, um, not counting San Francisco, obviously, uh, there's, I think, three major ones. That's Sam Trans, the Caltrain, the VTA, and then BART a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you re- you've ridden Caltrain, you said, right? Yeah, I've ridden Caltrain a lot. It's just very, if you're in the peninsula, that's what you ride. That has probably the most frequent ridership just because it's easy access from all the big tech headquarters to San Francisco if you need to go talk to finance people because they're usually based out of there. So 
And then for the average show like me, I go there to go watch Giants games. I think the Warriors stadium's there now. So that's what I would do if I still lived there in, you know, uh, Palo Alto, San Jose. But yeah. That uh, fractiousness of like 21 different agencies reminds me of like the oh, no, early... Oh, 27. 27, Jesus. That reminds me of like the early days of just transit in America where it was all these like competing like for-profit companies, you know? We look at public transit as this very like leftist, like utility owned by the city, run for the city. Um, but no, it was like made out of this very like, you know, profit motive in yeah. the beginning. Uh, you can see that a little bit in Chicago. With the bus system, sometimes a bus stop is before a light and sometimes it's after. The existing independent bus companies, like one of them bought spaces after lights and one of them bought spaces before lights. And you can still kind of see that today. But I'm a big fan of subsidiarity, which is the strong towns term. I mean, they don't own the term. It's actually yeah. like a Catholic term, right, <laughs> originally. But it's like the smallest unit of governance should handle things. But if you have 27 agencies all trying to achieve a similar thing, which is like get people to their jobs especially if there's like overlap in that, like that's, that's like the prime case for kind of top down, like big government thing. That's like the one use case for it. Yeah. But what do I know? I don't know. But yeah. Um, I mean, it makes sense that the San Francisco metropolitan area is split up into so many independent cities because the Bay itself creates like physical barriers that like are now easy to traverse, but yeah. back in the day were not. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it makes sense that San Francisco never was, able to expand across the bay yeah but mm-hmm. like it makes things less efficient like yeah. uh luckily like the reason why chicago has so many square miles like 225 something around there is because we're in competition with new york yeah. for a period to be the most populous cities and so mm-hmm. in both areas there were like Annexation. they were bordering like places that were annexed that were willing mm-hmm. to be annexed because they like had civic pride around maybe being the biggest city mm-hmm. but yeah san francisco yeah. The people there, it seems like they don't even really want, like, say, like, you live in, um, you live in San Jose or you live in Berkeley. You don't, they don't really seem to want to be part of San Francisco. Like, they're happy being in their own place. Mm -hmm. To me, as a Chicagoan, I always go there and I'm like, I'm surprised that they don't Mm -hmm. want to live within the borders of San Francisco more. Because here it means more, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting, like, choice that I think cities faced back then is, like, go annexation crazy. Like, New York and Chicago. And I think New York... I don't know. This is, I think Staten Island is such an overreach for New York to own. Yeah. Like, that's just so, like, sure. You know, yeah, let's give you Staten Island, like, <laughs> just so that you can, like, win in the land area and population math. Yeah. I feel like every, everything that Chicago has within its limits, like, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's some pretty suburban feeling bits of the city. It's like, oh, interesting that this is, like, because there's parts of the suburbs that are more dense than parts of the city. You know, those are always interesting. But I don't know. I think Chicago's borders make a decent amount of sense. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So just like, I don't know, this is just one little part of the country, but it has such outsized control over just like, I don't know how the rest of the country is run. I mean, like here you're like Rafa, you're working in Chicago in tech. And yet, like, you kind of live on their time, like not in your meetings every day, but like they set the tone for like what's happening at your job, right? Yeah, exactly. So back when I used to work for my previous company, it was really, really large, by far the largest. And essentially, one of the goals was like move everything off of Azure DevOps into GitHub because they had just bought GitHub and they figured that, oh, development's just going to happen on GitHub for any new features. Yeah, but for the most part, I don't think it's... I am, I guess, tech adjacent, but it doesn't affect me too much. I I just, you know, everyone sort of works under tech, but not necessarily. I lost the plot. Shit. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I do think that they have like undue control. And part of that is just because like we as a society have become comfortable with concentrated power And San Francisco is a place that benefits from concentrated power. New York City is too. Chicago is as well. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the biographies of people like prior to 1950, they would end up in like the most random places. Like they would be like born in like Scranton, Pennsylvania, and then they would like go to Chicago and then Pittsburgh 
and then they go to Kansas City, and then they go to San Francisco, and then they go to New York, and they'd be hopping around the whole country, including in these small cities that like people of notoriety today would not really like find a reason to go to. And it's because like power was less centralized. Mm -hmm. And that was better and healthier for us as a country. Like I think San Francisco has an inherent beauty. My mom's side is from there. And I really love how it looks. I do think though that like it's not good for things to be so concentrated because mm -hmm. like people want to have a stake in society and like the people who have a stake in society in San Francisco what do they do with it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's the it's end like, result? Yeah. It's like going back to what we were saying about like, why doesn't this look like a utopia? Like why yeah. isn't it getting reinvested in the world around it? Like when we do have this like uber rich class, like they should be building like the most like <laughs> pyramids, essentially they should be like, even if it is like a vanity project, they should be building something. And yeah, these like tech entrepreneurs do like reinvest this stuff. They, you know, have buildings named after them on college campuses, stadiums, sports teams, all the like, you know, venues for wealth that have been around for a while. Yeah. But yeah, in Chicago, like our rich people really, they, they keep the money in here, you know? And going back to the, also the bedroom community thing, like San Jose does not like have these amazing things mm. that Chicago does. Like the Pritzker's like you know, Maggie yeah. Daly Park and like the Pritzker Pavilion and all these reinvestments. Bruce Ron, what is it? Not Bruce Ronner. The rich guy, like the like front path in Chicago is due to that guy from what's it called Citadel investments. Like he poured tons of money into there and that's why like there's actually like separation between runners and cyclists on the path. He widened it out there. Like, I yeah. Know. Yeah. I have this idea that the reason why you don't see like the same sort of like monuments or just like uh, places of civic pride in like Sunbelt cities, which I would, I would say San Jose is a Sunbelt city, right? I'm um, sure. You think so? Yeah. Okay. So I think part of the reason why is because now the uber wealthy people of the world, the elites, they view themselves as being like transnational and Global they view citizens. themselves as being like international citizens and they're able to get on a plane and move like anywhere they want. And so they're not as rooted. Like the Pritzkers are an old family and there are generations of them there. It's a big family. And we benefit from them like viewing themselves as being part of this place being like patrons of the city in general basically yeah. like how you commission a piece of art they like partially commission the city sorry if this sounds like we're like groveling at the feet of the Pritzkers but like no no they're like they're kind of how I want the rich to behave I pre I like them more than like Ken Griffin who left the city that's the guy I'm thinking of yeah right. Ken Griffin did before he left the city at least poured a lot of money into the lakefront trail you know, that's did he? Something. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's something. I was, something. I named still, him because yeah, I thought he ran he off to Florida anything. in like pursuit of less regulation and taxes. But, yeah, like he's someone who I always got the feeling like didn't fully yeah. appreciate this place. Yeah, fair weather, like billionaire. You know? Yeah, I feel sort of the same way about Zuckerberg. Like his his grandiose thing is like reforming education. My brother went mm -hmm. to a Zuckerberg school. Um, mm -hmm. You know, essentially the premise is is that. You have individual one-on-one -on -one, uh, massive online course training, but tutor help when you need it. So it's essentially a pretty similar 30 kid count per teacher, except all the instruction is done online at your own pace. And then if you need help or get stuck, the teacher will swing by and then help you work through a problem. Hmm. And that didn't work well, but only because my brother is was deeply unserious. But I found that interesting. Um, another interesting thing about, I think, Meta is that when they moved into East Palo Alto, they used to be in Menlo Park, like a deeper part of Menlo Park. But now they're like in a more far out place of Menlo Park that's closer to East Palo Alto. And they've been doing a lot of really interesting um, low income housing initiatives and just building it back up. Um, they just have the money and power to get things pushed through there. Uh, East Palo Alto used to be one of the most dangerous places back in the 70s mm -hmm. during the crack epi epidemic. But because they had the highest per capita murder rate, they got a lot more community policing and then also other police officers from the neighboring towns. And that sort of died down pretty immediately after they had that notoriety. Mm -hmm. But it's still interesting to see how the area developed. Obviously, like there's an Ikea 
in the 90s <laughs> yeah. so that that development for sure helps too but mm. it's a really interesting um case study of how you can turn an area around and then mm. how big companies moving there can try and make it a little better not to suck on the teeth of meta and facebook yeah. but it's like yeah uh, recently zuckerberg decided to post in this age of you know populism post about his wagyu steak yeah. Oh um, yeah, that post. Yeah. Um, where he feeds his cows macadamia nut meal and uh, beer, like his wagyu cows, they, he feeds macadamia nuts and beer. It's intense. I don't know if I. And he he jokes about his bunker too. He's like playing Call of Duty with his bros in the bunker, and that's really funny. I don't know. It's <laughs> it's so gross, and you know, th- usually as a billionaire, you're supposed to have some noblesse oblige. You know, (laughs) where you spare the world. But in this Mm -hmm. case of, you know, I'm a billionaire and look at my stuff because of social media, it's it kind of breaks the the social contract, I feel, because things are always sort of this is, I guess, my moral view of the world. Things are always going to be unequal, but you shouldn't really be coy about it. You should be like at least like try and hide it. Yeah, I mean. If we break up big tech, <laughs> it will be a lot less unequal. Right. Yeah. It, it will be interesting if they do decide to b- break up big tech because currently under the U.S. antitrust laws, it's all about the consumer. In right now, the consumer is thriving. You get your stupid crap from China mm-hmm. in two days, you know, mm-hmm. uh, thanks to Amazon. Um, your life is improved. So I'm going to just cite like Shretechery, uh, Ben Thompson, his thoughts on like antitrust, I guess, uh, mostly there's platforms and aggregators. Um, Reddit would be an aggregator. Facebook would be a platform. Interesting. It, well, it's, it's both a platform and an aggregator now, now that like Facebook marketplace is so dominant. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the one reason I keep Facebook around. Exactly. Facebook yeah. And then Netflix would be a platform like in its early stage. It's a platform for you getting your DVDs and now you know, streaming, whatever. And then um, Amazon, obviously a platform. Well, okay. Um, yeah, obviously a platform. I've never heard Amazon. the spectrum is like this platform aggregator kind of like, yeah, scale. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, Ben Thompson is like the thought leader in this space. Um, he's, he's a, his, his blog is a great reach, uh, Stratechery. Annoying to pronounce, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So within that aggregation theory, um, for antitrust, his framework for regulation is mostly about the third parties, the aggregators and the users and how they intermediate between those two. And then within platforms, they facilitate that relationship between the third parties and the users and platforms. And then obviously you can abuse your power as a platform or as an aggregator, but the way that those two are abused are in different ways. Oh. So that's how you would sort of delineate those and then begin to... So they need two different treatments. They need two different antitrust-like approaches. Right. Basically, if you're an aggregator or if you're a platform. Right. Because currently under our current system, like you get out really, really good if you're a consumer, like straight up, you're, you're having a ball. I'm having a ball. <laughs> With the content stream. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it feels like the yeah, Americans will accept a lot as long as we get our cheap consumer goods and our content. Yeah. You know, those are our two things that like, if that can be delivered to us in a more streamlined and cheaper way, we'll like sacrifice, sacrifice our like, I don't know, neighborhood businesses closing down or <laughs> stuff. Like we just want our, want a continuous supply of it. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, so like I think under the types of abuses, right, you can do vertical foreclosure where they're just like, no, we don't like you. We have a gatekeeper role. We're this is our app store. There's rent seeking behavior, you know, just like we're Apple, give us thirty percent if you want anything on our app store, mm-hmm. right? And then um, you know, bundling would be this is not like a fang, but bundling would be Windows, you had to use Internet Explorer oh, yeah. with Windows, Netscape. Um, you could install Netscape separately, but people just defaulted to Windows Explorer. Mm-hmm. Sorry, in, Internet Explorer. Jeez. Um, and then also self-dealing, just like we we can provide our services 
to ourselves better than anyone else, like Amazon, with, um, actually, no, sorry. I guess this would be different for like, okay, in the example here, Ben Thompson says that within co-authoring Microsoft Office documents, if you're in OneDrive, you can just open it up and it works in the Office desktop app, but you can't do that if you're using Dropbox yeah. or Box. Yeah, so that's, a bun so that's bundling, right? Uh, that would be self-dealing. Self bundling. bundling would be, you know, bundling would be within um, the iPhone. You have to use iMessage. Oh, uh, yeah. And then that's, I always love, you know, the debate over should I have an iPhone or an Android? Oh, and for the, yes, the green, the green, in the gender green war. message dialogue. Yeah. In the gen <laughs> this front in the gender war. Yeah. Yeah. It's very goofy, but yeah. Um, no, yeah. I feel that sharing sharing moments is important and i like my high quality images and videos so i have an iphone mm -hmm. yeah my transition from like being an android enthusiast where i was again like side loading custom software to like just being a norm like a apple normie is just like when you really think about what do you do on your phone like all i do is just message and take photos it seems sometimes like yeah you can consume content like why do i need to customize that why are my needs so different from anyone else like yeah I'm like there's a, that um just a guy there's a store in elston that's for like computer customization oh micro center yep yeah like yeah, it's I, great. I went there for the first time and it's like people build their own computers like yeah yep why so, yeah sorry this is this is what straight guys are doing with their time Building uh, computers. <laughs> I mean, I went there with a gay roommate. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, like, I've been. But, <laughs> yeah, no, um, I don't know. I, I don't get why you need to do that. I know they do it for like Bitcoin mining or whatever. Yeah, but, uh, but it's, it's, yeah, not anymore. Well, I guess still for Bitcoin mining, but now I guess the big thing is is that like I'm going to go and make my own large language model, you know, and then yeah. that's going to be fun. Um, the the effect on like LLMs on like ads it's mostly just google that's how they make their money it's just it's an ad business right yeah that's going to be interesting because personally in my experience i feel that chat gpt4 is way better than just having to google things and have to click we we've seo'd ourselves into google being almost useless yeah like mm. i i looked at chat gpt this week because i wanted to find out where i got this idea of for many years, I've prescribed to this idea that beauty is a sign from God that something is good. And I thought I got it from like Neoplatonism, like when I was learning about Neoplatonism in school. Uh, it might be, but they told me instead it was just from like aesthetic theology or something. <laughs> um, so yeah, I used it for that. That is wild how you use ChatGPT. I never touch it, but the way that you use it to like investigate your own prior assumptions. Because is... it's important for me to be accurate. Like there have been yeah. things on the podcast I mean, here and there, but like probably each episode that are like slightly off. Like, I think I said that the... I got um, something wrong on an earlier episode. It was bothering me, but I've, it's exited my mind, like many of my mistakes. Oh, yeah. But no, it'll be like small things. Like, uh, I think I brought up the 1978 Montreal Olympics, mm -hmm. but actually it was 1976. Unforgivable. Something like that. <laughs> it's, it's small stuff. Or like I said, like I was reading like Main Street by Sinclair Lewis when really it was... Upton or no, I said it was by Upton Sinclair, but it's actually by Sinclair Lewis. Yeah. Um, but no, the Wikipedia page for, the, for, for Sinclair Lewis says like not to be confused with Upton Sinclair. So hey, you're not the first guy. You know, yeah, they're like, they lived at the same time and they have similar names. Yeah, so. yeah that's true. But yeah, accuracy is important. But yeah. yeah, but you still have to indiv individually verify because I have to verify with at least the, I, I mostly use it to write boilerplate code. Right. Yeah. So I have to just make sure that, oh, this is actually doing what I want it to do. Yeah. You know? Whenever I want to know if like chat GPT is accurate, I ask it stuff about metro systems and I, I cross, I cross analyze it with my own knowledge and be like, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> you are the standard that you grade chat GPT against your own knowledge. Well, that's, I mean, yeah. Saying. Like they said, um, although like, I mean, they are wrong all the time. There's nuance occasionally, but no, like I'll look at it sometimes and I'll be like, no, they're not right about that train mm. fact. It's <laughs> not right. <laughs> Asking a robot train fact. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm completely terrified of AI. I have to sort myself into that category. I think everyone's on a bit of a spectrum. I just think we should go full, 
Luddite slash Mennonite, just like before we introduce a technology into our lives, just be like, is this going to benefit yeah. us? I think Let's beat up um, Sam Bakeman Fried. Yeah. No, who's yeah. the guy who no. owns OpenAI? Um, yeah. Sam, Sam Altman. Altman. Yep. Sam Altman. Yeah, Sam Altman. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, stuff scares me. But I, I don't know. I just feel this is like such a tempting thing to say. It's like, I feel like my job is pretty safe from AI. Um, but I don't know construction management. Yeah. I'm very like client focused. Like I'm physically in person. I'm directing work. I'm like, I'm sure maybe there's some inner roads that AI could make, but what I'm dovetailing this into is that like construction and tech have an interesting relationship. I mean, tech tries it to wriggle its way into any field and they usually like settle upon something that it can like fully actually do, you know, like, I mean, medicine, like medical records, companies like Re like Epic, you know, they found their niche and they really exploded into it. In construction, there's been a few kind of entry points. Zillow, well, first just like, you can do construction for tech companies. You can be like an owner's rep for them. Like this is just broadly in like anything in tech, like you could work at HR at a non-tech company and make yay money. And then you could like work, do the exact same job at a tech company, but they just have more, they're more flush with cash that they could just like pump up your salary. Not yeah. artificially. I mean, anything's I mean, artificial is not accurate, but, um, yeah, like I had a friend who, when I was in between jobs, was like, oh man, come on, work for Amazon, like build warehouses and stuff. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. Let me, let me yeah. look around a little harder before going to that, even though I'm sure we're making fucking I, I feel like bucks. if of any of the companies, they would be like the cheapest because yeah, yeah. uh, Jeff Bezos, he's my he's my most dreaded tech billionaire. I don't like him. Everyone has their own one that they yeah. hate the most. <laughs> Imagine yeah. being like an NYT lib and being like, oh, I hate um, Elon Musk so much for impairing democracy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone has their own pet hate <laughs> like yeah. tech billionaire. I love and how Zuckerberg's stock has gone up just yeah it's it's very superficial in america as long as you're like fit and you like you know you exhibit traditional values people will love you mm -hmm. yeah and people like older millennials have said this like that they witnessed this with like bill gates or bill gates was so hated in the 90s as just being a monopolist and yeah. like an evil nerd and then he's been rehabbed into like this wizened kind of philanthropist i think he should grow a beard like uh chomsky slash letterman slash John Stewart style mm -hmm. that just shows that you've like wisened to something late in life. Once you've like, yeah. you've left like your main moneymaker, you grow a beard and then you just come back yeah. and you just opine on things. But yeah. he's a Californian and beards are not Cali a California mm -hmm. thing. Uh -huh. uh, true. Bill Gates. No, I, I don't think he is because you yeah. know, Microsoft is, Oh, but he lives there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was, I, I guess I was just, whatever. Mm -hmm. He's from the <laughs> East coast, but no, he, yeah. yeah. Trans California. Well, I mean, I think he, I mean, like the majority of Microsoft is in Washington, Bellevue, right? So, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah so, um, no, but it's interesting that you mentioned Microsoft because like going back to the antitrust, like he would just acquire companies for the most part when they were very small, just to get them out of business. Mm -hmm. Like that's why he's such a monopolist in under our current regulatory framework. Like that's completely fine see like Facebook buying Instagram, right? Like they didn't have like, what is market share? Like it's only what, 30 million users when Instagram was bought out by Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. No, no I mean the best way to like, it, it's, it's much harder to break up a company than it is to prevent a merger. They should always try to do that first, but yeah, but, there it still is but how would you that. break up a company under our current framework right it's like you would have to you know talk about the vertical foreclosure that they do the rent seeking behavior that they do mm -hmm. and then that would be your framework because currently the only tools i mean to work with i'm not i'm not versed in the legal mechanisms to do it but i can envision mm -hmm. what it looks like like for example with social media one of the ways that we could have social media that's like not as centralized is that social media sites start to compete with each other based around like how addictive their products are, um, how much data they take from you. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them would be able to like give you money for the data that you sell to them. Like I can envision like an environment among social media companies that isn't as centralized. That, that, that's interesting because the things that you say would be more open would actually be more limiting because that raises the bar 
for an upstart company to, mm -hmm. you know, have to keep track of how much data each user has and, you know, oh, the, those payouts. Burdensome. Right. Yeah. Um, like, because, for example, I could make, like, there's tons of kids who have the idea to make f Facebook for whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can you can go and do that. Like, you don't have the network effect, effects where you will have users, but you can go and do that if you wanted to. But if you wanted to say, oh, yeah, here's all this regulatory limitations, that would be... Yeah, I mean, I, I used to be more skeptical of the idea of breaking up social media sites in particular because part of the the service they provide is the ability to give you as big a network as possible. Mm -hmm. But like in the last year, I've started to use Discord more than any other social media site. And I'm the happiest I've ever been using social media. Mm -hmm. I feel like actually connected to people through it. And mm -hmm. it's just like it's an insular world and it works way better yeah. than like a global network. a large network. thing, yeah. Um, the guy who invented Second Life, uh, he's a big skeptic of the metaverse. I love that because Second Life always gets brought up at like one of the first examples of something yeah. approaching the metaverse. I haven't heard the word metaverse in like six months. Yeah, no, it's dead. Yeah, it's and I have so much schadenfreude at seeing that kind of fail. But yeah, this guy from Second Life said that like the metaverse is here and it's Discord. You know, oh, yeah, it's just in your pocket. Like you don't need to put on a VR headset to like interface with a world that has its own like rules and mores and regular people that you know in it and that you can go to. So I just, I don't know. I, things are always simpler. Like, yeah, there's always going to be a place for like these very low frick, like just texting and voice calling, you know, mm -hmm. so phone calls and messaging like that will always have primacy over fucking putting a headset on and having like five feet clear in every direction from you to like be in a <laughs> VR world. That's so interesting. I never yeah. really thought of that. Cause like, I, I assume just like, Discord is just essentially a big group text within a server, you know? Mm -hmm. And I find it because it's just Discord is IRC chats from like the early 90s. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm struggling to like comprehend because I've always thought as the metaverse as like you inhabit a virtual avatar. But it, if it's just a persona under different servers, I guess that makes mm -hmm. enough sense for me. Yeah. I don't know, tech companies like love to overcomplicate things because there's like only so much you can really sell to people. There needs to be a next thing, there needs to be a next frontier, there needs to be a world, but like people don't naturally want all of that. You have to force them to want it. I don't know, yeah. I think <laughs> text messaging and calling is just always gonna be a thing in different forms, different tweaks, you know? Yeah, on the on the limits of technology and tech companies, like back to my little construction spiel. It's not really a field that's like ripe for destruction. For disruption, um, it's pretty localized. Um, there are like super large developers, but those have been around since before tech. These are always like tracked home developers. They deal with all the hurdles of just like you know regulation, getting a large chunk of land, dealing with local government. Once they have that squared away, um, they've made the few tweaks for the site. They can just kind of roll, and then they just you know build tracked homes, and that's like that is that is what big construction looks like. You know, and that's been around for a while. And they're a specialized kind of like, like they're like a racehorse. They do one thing. But you mentioned Epic Systems and I view them as sort of like a racehorse with they their, just do one thing, yeah. yeah, they just do one thing really well. So, and I don't see why that couldn't exist for construction. Yeah. I guess it's hard in the flipping kind of world, in the renovation, like in new construction, like um, you can control more of the variables basically, but in renovation, you're given a lot more that you must deal with, right. a lot more fixed things. And so Zillow thought that it could leverage its knowledge of the housing market with like all the data that it has about house prices and what people are looking for and what areas, what appreciates over time. And then with that, like <laughs> I picture like a kind of uh, Professor X like puts on the helmet and visualizes all of the home price data <laughs> in the country and then sees like spots out of all that plucks an area that is like if you put... 50,000 into this home that will reap you 250,000 because of these you know, like intrinsic things in the market. Yeah. But they lost, uh, what was it? $800 million <laughs> on their, yeah. on their foray into flipping homes. Cause yeah. like you need to basically like build up an industry wherever you go. You need to find all these like, yeah, I mean, contacts. fingers crossed, hopefully the housing market crashes 50% and all these grifters get what, get what's coming. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I get immense 
like schadenfreude <laughs> from seeing them fail at this because it's I get to say like see not everyone can do my job and I feel better about this than when like mom and pop flippers fail at my job that I actually feel a little bad about because that they're like tricked into by HGTV that anyone can do this and it turns out no yeah. not everyone can do this and now like you've lost money and it's like really damaging to people's economics to be a bad flipper yeah another tech startup was reno run you would buy they'd have like a very slick app and you'd buy construction materials and they'd like get it to you very fast if you paid a premium or like within the day or the next day if you didn't pay a premium um it was very strange they had like gig workers so we'd have guys show up to our construction sites with like crazy face tattoos and one of them was like i had gotten a whole bunch of 12 foot studs and um oh no i wanted 10 foot studs they only had 12s they brought those they didn't fit into the elevator um and the guy's like I can run it up all three floors. And I was like, you're a, you're on crack. <laughs> like, if, if, if you are ready and willing to do that for absolutely no increase in price. like <laughs> They went under eventually. Sometimes it was clear they were just buying the stuff from Home Depot. They would just send a guy in a truck to go buy from Home Depot, which Home Depot has a delivery service, but it's not as like quick as this. Yeah. But the prices were too good. Like that's why they went under. Like they weren't charging us what they should have. I'm sure because they were probably flush with capital. Mm-hmm. And so they were trying to do the classic like, undercut like if you have tons of venture capital coming into you you don't need to charge as much for your services and so you can get more market share and then you can flip the switch as they say and then start charging people actual market prices but they're too indebted to you i feel like that's what chipotle did and that's why it sucks now (laughs) yeah first spread you know get people used to it get people hooked to it and then just slowly like raise and just kind of i don't know play chicken with your customer over how much they're going to pay for a steak bowl um, I have yeah. a question regarding like the Zillow because I know that it was like Zillow, Open Door, and Redfin who were doing the home buying. Yeah, Zillow um, offers. and then, I, but I guess it's just I don't really understand the real estate market because they had everyone pulled out because no one could understand <laughs> what a fair price was during COVID times. Yeah, I so guess that killed a lot of them there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it was uncertainty kills the housing market. Right. It, like, just the fact people didn't know what was going to happen after COVID. It is funny, like listening to like, back on Strong Towns bit. Um, there's an episode from like 2021 where they're talking about like you know when ever when quote unquote everyone was moving out to the suburbs because of COVID. What's the future of cities? And everyone on the podcast was like, no, people will come back to cities. Cities are already built. Like they're not going to yeah. be unbuilt because of this. Like it'll go back to normal. And it's like that's. That's what I believe in the moment. That was just very vindicating to hear someone else believe that. And then, yes, that's the case. Like, no, the like rental slash housing yeah. market in Chicago never cratered or anything. People didn't move out of Manhattan and Mass. Some of them did, and then yeah. people moved into to replace them. You know. Yeah, as much as I love my favorite podcast, Breaking Points, they like. I mean, they've been doing it as much since like the Israel Palestine stuff started, but. They were doing like a like a clip a week or multiple clips a week, basically saying like, oh my gosh, like cities are cratering. Look at this. Look at like mm-hmm. how much like people are fleeing like urban centers and it's like a doom loop. And I was like the whole time, I like I literally I sent them in a question <laughs> because I was like annoyed. I was like, have you thought about having an expert in urban planning on <laughs> yeah. to talk about the 70s and the 80s? Yeah. Because, like, that was, like, rock bottom for cities. I mean, people could accuse us of that on this podcast, that we talk out of pocket about stuff that we don't know. But this is why we bring in help, like Rafa. Yeah. Um, to understand no, I things. feel like I talk about things on this podcast that I do know about. Yeah. The only times I feel like I'm reaching our, our fashion stuff, which is funny, it's <laughs> like, that's just the which least. You, yeah, actual. everyone should second guess their, like, fashion assessments. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, should we talk about how people dress in Silicon Valley? Yeah, that was, I think that was the start of our idea for this episode. No, it wasn't. No. You just always want to do fashion stuff. I want to do fashion stuff. I think (laughs) we've got a market there. I think people want boy nymphed alumni, as we say. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Um. (laughs) But there's like, there's a lack. Like, that is the reason. Back to Bill Gates, he kind of kicked this off. Like, he was the vanguard of uh, smart casual and business casual, basically taking off the tie and the jacket. Mm -hmm. He was getting like the blue dress shirt and khakis. And once he did that, then I mean, yeah, all bets were off. People have just gotten more casual as the years have gone on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more more sleek. I don't know. I personally yeah. buy all my stuff from Uniqlo, but mm-hmm. Everlane is pretty big in San Francisco, it's, uh, the, the Valley, I guess. Theory too, but that's just like everywhere. Do you feel like when you walk around Chicago, you'll sometimes see people who would be like, "I think they're from the Bay Area based off what they're wearing." 
Um, I've had that said about me. Um, <laughs> when, when most of our f- friends, when I tell them where I'm from, they're just like, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But they probably didn't guess it until you said it. Yeah, true. Yeah, people retroactively kind of apply. Like, oh, I would have known that. It's like, well, why, why didn't you say it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny because, like, the clothes themselves are often startups that wish to disrupt, you know, clothing. Um, and I've, yeah. always, I've railed against this of, like, clothing is not a problem to solve. It is not, like, an inefficiency that needs to be smoothed over. Like, uh, I it mean, is they're... supposed to be friction-y. It's supposed to be difficult. It's supposed to be a journey. It's supposed to be an expression of yourself. And then my last thing on that is that it's supposed to be a little bit uncomfortable. But I don't think people agree with me on that. <laughs> I just kind of like restrictive clothing. Yeah. I mean, for me, I don't have that many brands that I'm excited about or that I like to shop at. Mm-hmm. I would love to see more because, like, I'm not happy. Because there's there's very little middle between fast fashion and um, high-end fashion. Mm-hmm. The stuff in the middle, there's not enough of it. So I always want to see more. But yeah, I don't hate how like the look that tech bros have brought into office environments, partly because I'm not in an office. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) But you're pro hoodie. Okay, am I pro hoodie? I guess I am. (laughs) I mean, I do like hoodies. But yeah, I I would prefer if guys went to work, though, dressed up more. I think it does look better. Yeah, I just don't like the like false posturing i just i don't know the whole like oh like dressing up is such an onus and my job is so important that like i can't bother with it you know like i need to be in a t-shirt i need to be in essentially performance gear for being on a computer you know like it's like i'm too busy being effective to like bother with the artifice of wearing a collar i need to wear a t-shirt um it's annoying when you you meet someone who's presenting themselves in a way where it's a non-uniform, but it is a uniform. Yeah. Like, um, it's like countercultures and stuff where they're like, Oh, I'm not like you other people. And it's like, well, you're so dressed, dressed yeah. so similar to all your friends. I mean, yeah. you, you coordinate a fit and people feel like that takes, that taxes you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But also I feel like for the tech bro to dress up, it is the sort of energy of like a teenage girl <laughs> with another teenage girl being like, let's put on makeup for fun. it's like like, yeah it's not fully there they're they're not doing it like earnestly Mm -hmm. they'll they'll put on the tuxedo but like the the whole time they're wearing it they're just thinking about it you know suit supply has light tech company feel to it i have to say um they're in like city centers they don't really go into small markets at all they have a large online component um but they, they do have like they're they're very focused on their physical stores and their thing is that they do want to take like the guesswork and and they want to bring like a consistency to the buying a suit game. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. When you go back home, do you see that the clothing has changed at all recently? Um, not really for the most part. It's just very Californian. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just like, yeah. Hoodies. <laughs> do you like going back home? Um, for the most part, yeah, it's great. I mean, the reason why housing prices are so expensive there is just because you have more sun. <laughs> yeah. I think there's more to it than that. But I yeah, mean, that's a big part. Yeah, I the mean, like the weather is nice. Like, I, I I took umbrage with one of the things I think you guys are on about regarding. Oh, yeah, we've uh, been talking smack. You've been really quiet. So. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I think it was regarding just like um, driving, right? Or was it driving or housing prices? One of the two. But um, yeah, people people like the Bay Area because you can drive to any number of really interesting um, locales and biomes and just have a great time there. So Oh, this is something, you know, we mentioned this in the docket where like, um, Nathan, you think that the urban fabric of the Pacific Northwest kind of sucks because the nature is so good? No, yeah. I, my idea is that, or sorry, okay, I'm friends with one person in Chicago <laughs> who moved here from Portland in the last year, and like, his Instagram feed is talking about Portland constantly, like yesterday, he shared pictures of iced over highways in Portland, that he he like went on to, like webcam footage online, took screenshots, posted yeah. to Instagram of ice on roads in Portland. It's like he's not over his ex. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, okay, but it just... 
<laughs> well, no, I'm just saying that like like this guy's relationship is with Portland, you know, <laughs> like he's clear like in Chicago, but he's okay. still hung up on. Uh, but no, okay, it's easy for me to be a hater, and I, I guess I I, w- I want to refrain just because I feel bad for Rafa. Huh? Put, no, it's it's fine. You can but, hate, but I feel that I know, like Port- the the prices justify <laughs> how great California is because if it was so bad. The housing prices would go down, right? Yeah, people wish to live there. Yeah. yeah I can't argue with that. Yeah. And yeah. I think that the reverse is true for Chicago. Like, our biome is so bland that it, like, we create beautiful architecture out of, like, we have to, like, out of necessity. Like, the human mind needs something beautiful to look at, as I'm sure you'd agree with, Nathan. You know, like, yeah. you crave beauty. And where we don't see it, like, we put it upon ourselves. Like, okay, right, if God is not going to do it, we shall. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, we have, like, natural features that are beautiful, like the lake and the river. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I think one of the most beautiful mm-hmm. parts of Chicago is along the river walk. Like, and not because of the river itself, but just, like, the buildings. Like, mm-hmm. the ability to be in the center of all that. Like, on a boat. It's so pretty. Yeah. But, right. And, and that's all built, you know? That's, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, like, California is just sort of natural in a way it's just always been like this with the redwoods in you know drive to mount lassen or yellowstone or um yellowstone geez uh yosemite oh, yeah. yeah or no, that, that went right past me <laughs> like, didn't even yeah i know um that, and, and, and then or just go to the, like the chaparral and then there's nice oaks and obviously you know there's the bay itself you can sail there or you could sail on the ocean you know it's yeah beaches but yeah, I do. Okay. So I do think that there is a little bit too much cachet placed on natural beauty. Like personally, like I... You I'm, hate going outside, Nathan. I know. <laughs> yeah. I used uh, to be so much more tan when I lived yeah, in California. Yeah. Okay. But no, I do think California is beautiful. Like I, San Francisco, especially like it's beautiful for the housing, but it's also beautiful for the actual You have not seen beauty. the Sunset District, but yeah. I, I agree. have it in Sunset District. Really? Uh-huh. It's so yeah. it's so ugly. <laughs> no, like sure? my, my grandma grew up in the mission. Mm-hmm. My like grandma's best friend is in Daly City. I've been all over the Bay Area. Like, yeah. It's um, the waffle sort of shape. Yeah. And, yeah. Do you think that okay, that's crazy. <laughs> no, different I mean, strokes, different strokes. Yeah. I mean, there isn't a part of the city I've seen that I think there's there's only one part of the city I've been to that I think is mid, and that's the Presidio. Sure. <laughs> I don't know why it just. Doesn't I do think I think you me. need to Google like the Sunset District and like just <laughs> yeah. drop just drop your you know Google Maps Street View walk around on like any part yeah. of Sunset mm-hmm. District because I think we might have different views. Okay, <laughs> on what beauty is? Yeah, I don't know. I have been there though. I do remember mm-hmm. being there, but I'll look at it again. Are there any other final opinions that you want to give on Silicon Valley, Rafa? Um, yeah, beautiful area. Everyone has that build mindset that you don't really see anymore in America that I think is really admirable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because they come from all over, you know, like Silicon Valley is mostly transplants. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Did you ever know anyone that was like a multi-generational person in, from the area? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But um, the the people that like make up the tech bro mindset that we associate Silicon Valley from are normally from all over the country. So yeah. it's very egalitarian. Uh, sorry. It's very, I'm searching for the word. Egalitarian. egalitarian. I don't think it's that one. Meritocratic. Though. It's um, very diverse, I guess, in that sense. Yeah. Because you get opinions from all over. Um, as long as, you know, they had a, obviously they're all going to be STEM nerds. So <laughs> Take that as you will. Yeah, yeah there's no hot librarians down there. I'm sure. I'm sure there are some, you know, but yeah. Um, what else? <laughs> I don't know. What can be said about so the? Well, not. I guess just Silicon Valley, San Francisco. I think you need to have like Lauren on separate. Yeah, episode. yeah. because mm-hmm. we're because conflating the two will bring the pitchforks out, mm-hmm. and it's just like no. Like whenever I talk, you'll notice it's specifically about the lower part of the peninsula, right? Mm-hmm. Silicon Valley versus San Francisco, Oakland. Yeah. That's that's its own a beast within itself. It's just the the art that used to be there is a lot. It's just a lot more different. The 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 culture, you know, it, it's the cultured part, right? It's like comparing the Philippines to Japan, 
right? Mm. It's just like don't dunk on your own country, huh? No, I mean, sorry, <laughs> not your country. Where you're, eth- you're well, no, I I have a citizenship. Yeah, yeah it is my oh. country, but like still, you know, it's it just it's just so much more, right? Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. know, but, but it does it wouldn't have to be so much more if the people there reevaluated like they're too they busy wanted, building, you know, they're just like yeah, yeah we need to. We must oh, build. that's a good point. Yeah, they're too enveloped in the digital world to care about the right. physical environment that they live in. Yeah, the myopia of it. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Thanks to everyone for listening this week. You are our first guest. Yeah. Um, we're going to have more guests soon. Mm-hmm. And um, hopefully this audio quality wasn't too bad, but we're going to have to give it a listen. We'll find out. We'll find out. Um, but yeah, have a good one, everyone. Bye. See you. See you. Bye.